Hello everyone, Happy New Year! What better way to start the new year than to take a look at the hardest national math olympiad around, which is the China Math Olympiad. So the latest CMO was held in November last year, but some sources will call this the CMO2024. Regardless of the year, let us take a look at problem number one from the latest CMO, which is supposed to be the easiest problem from the problem set. So here we have problem one, which is a number theory problem. Find the smallest lambda, which is a real number, such that for all n, which is a positive integer, there at least positive integers x1, x2, and x2, 0, 2, 3, satisfying the following. First, n is written as a product of x1, until x2, 0, 2, 3. And secondly, for all the i from 1 to 2, 0, 2, 3, either xi is a prime, or xi is less than or equal to n to the lambda. Okay, so it's a bit of a mouthful. But actually, this problem, what I like about it, is that the solution is easily motivatable. So let us now try uh, first go through some motivation in order to better understand the problem as well as to motivate the solution. So when you face your problem like this, it usually helps to think about small cases to begin understanding the problems and what the difficulties are. So let's not care about the lambda first or finding the smallest lambda. Let's just first start with small values of n and see if we can find positive integers that meet the conditions. Of course, Lambda is involved here, but let's say we don't care about lambda, we, we are allowed to choose lambda freely first. So, if we want to write n equals 1 as a product of 2, 0, 2, 3 positive integers, of course you can just use 1, 1, 1 times 1 times 1 and so on. Now 1 is not a prime, but 1, as long as lambda is uh, greater than or equal to 0, then it will definitely fulfill this condition. So this is sort of like a very trivial example. So let's do something more interesting. So when n equals to 2, can I find positive integers such that n is a product? Well, I mean, the only way is to have 2 times 1 times 1 and so on. And yeah, 2 is a prime. And again, 1 should satisfy this quite easily. When lambda is uh, greater than or equal to 0, that will already work. So at this point, you might realize that actually this condition is quite lax. If we have n being a product of a certain number of primes and that and in particular, greater, uh, less than or equal to 2, 0, 2, 3 primes, then I can just simply write n as the product of the, of its, uh, prime factors, n times 1 times 1 times 1 and so on, to use up all 2, 0, 2, 3 x's. Then this way of writing n as the product, uh, satisfy the condition because you're either using a prime or you're using 1. So, what is the difficulty here? The difficulty here happens when you have more than 2, 0, 2, 3 prime factors. So, what happens if n is actually p to the power of 2, 0, 2, 4? This is where things get interesting. You notice that actually, if I want to write this as a product of uh, 2, 0, 2, 3 different positive integers, I mean, you can only put p or 1s here, or powers of p's here, and at least one of the term must be at least p squared. So you realize that, well, you need to definitely use p square somewhere, or at least p square, could be p cubed and so on, at least p square, and that will not be a prime. So you need p square to be less than or equal to n to the lambda, and that puts a condition on lambda. So you need p square less than or equal to n to the lambda, n here is p to the 2024, and this tells you that, well, you need lambda to be at least 1 over 1012. So this seems to be one well, of the first instance where you realize that lambda cannot be just any uh, non-negative number, there's some constraint. So you might think, okay, maybe this might not be enough, but it turns out that uh, we shall now prove that lambda equals 1 over 1012 will already work. So this is, we'll prove that this is the smallest that is uh, necessary and sufficient. So, uh, Based on the motivation earlier, we can already prove that if lambda is less than 1 over 1012, it will not work. So I will just write this out formally. If lambda is less than 1 over 1012, we can just consider the example of n equals p to the 2024. And so, as we argued before, some xi needs to be greater than or equal to p squared, uh, which will then be bigger than n to the lambda if lambda is too small. And this would uh, contradict the requirements of the problem. So therefore, we proved that lambda must be at least 1 over 1012 in order for it to work. 
And so now let us show that lambda equals 1 over 1, 0, 1, 2 actually works. Okay, and again, the proof for this part of the problem is actually quite natural to motivate. So what we'll do is, uh, let's suppose n is given, we need to show that we can conjure out the x1 to x2023. Of course, if n has less than or equal to 2023 prime factors, then uh, we, as we showed before, that case is already easily handled. We just write x, we just use the prime factors as the xi and fill up the rest of the xi with 1. So let's suppose instead that n is bigger than, has bigger than 2023 prime factors. And I'm going to list them in decreasing order, p1 uh, greater than or equal to p2, dot 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 greater than or equal to pr. Okay? Now, the quite natural thing to do is, I want to distribute the primes across the xi's so that uh, I don't make any one of them uh, too big, right? Because I want to keep this inequality. Of course, if it's in the end, if xi is a prime, then we are good. But if it's a composite, we want to make sure it's not a gigantic composite. So this motivates the following very natural algorithm to distribute the primes. We start off with all the xi's being equal to 1. And then we distribute, or we, or rather we allocate out the primes uh, in decreasing order. So starting with p1, we'll allocate to one of the xi's. Then p2 allocate to one of the xi's and so on. And what is the algorithm to allocate? So at the point where we are allocating pi to one of the x's, what we'll do is we'll look for the smallest x. Uh, if there's a tie, we just pick one arbitrarily, it doesn't matter. And then we'll allocate the pi to the x. So meaning we'll multiply in the pi to the value of the x. Uh, basically to say like I have make the x take up the burden of pi. And then we'll move on to pi plus 1. Look for the smallest x at the point again allocate it, and so on. So, what this means is, let's consider what happens at the end. So, at the end, right, we have some which might be still a prime number, or 1, and good for them, they definitely meet the requirement. What we are concerned about is the composite numbers. They need to be less than or equal to n to the lambda, correct? So let's just take a look at the largest composite. If we can show that the largest composite is less than or equal to n to the lambda, we will have settled all the composites. So without loss of generality, I'm just going to say x1 is the largest composite. I can always just relabel the, the numbers, the notation. So as I mentioned, it suffices to show that x1 is less than or equal to n to the 1 over 1, 0, 1, 2. So I'll write it in this way. I need to show n greater than or equal to x1 to the 1, 0, 1, 2. And when I put in in this way, it quite easily motivates the next idea of the proof because uh, what I want to show now is when x, y is a certain value, all the other values cannot be so much smaller uh, that it causes this to be, this inequality to be violated. It, the x2 to x2023 will need to be of a certain minimum value such that when you multiply everything together, n is actually bounded below by this. So, what does, more concretely, what does this uh, translate to in terms of the proof? Well, Firstly, we need to use some characteristic of x1, right? So I'm going to suppose x1 uh, can be written as y times pk, where pk is the last prime multiplied into x1. So basically, look at the last prime that was thrown into x1. Call that pk. Then let y be uh, x1 over pk, okay? Now, from here, we get two different conclusions. The first conclusion is that because we allocate out the primes in uh, descending order. This means that actually y, which has, uh, which is a product of earlier allocated primes, will definitely be bigger than or equal to pk. Even if it's just one prime by itself, it's still allocated earlier than pk, so it's bigger than or equal to pk. So when you multiply both sides by y and then take the square root, you get y squared greater than or equal to pk times y, which is x1, right? And you take the square root, you get y bigger than or equal to square root x1. So keep this in mind. It's quite intu quite an intuitive thing. Basically, this uh this other part uh that is not pk is at least the square root of x one. Okay, but back to the main argument. Why do we care about uh this deconstruction? Well, 
remember the goal here is to show that all the other values x2 to x2023 is not too small. So when you multiply everything, n is at is also not too small, correct? So let's think about the value of x2 to x2023. Now, just before we allocate out pk, at the point where we are about to allocate pk, the fact that we choose to allocate to x1 by our algorithm means that x1 is actually the smallest or it could be tight smallest at that juncture, right? So x1 at that juncture is y and the fact that it's the smallest means x2 to x2023 at that juncture must be at least y. So you see where we are going with this? At the end, after allocating this pk, we might allocate even more primes out. And when we allocate primes out, the number can, the values can only be uh, going up, right? So at the end of the whole process, we still have x2 to x2023 be all greater than or equal to y. So this is what I mean by all of them cannot be too small in value. There must be a certain minimum value to it. And indeed, when we multiply all of them together to get n, we see that all this is therefore at least x1 times y to the 2022. And then now we use this observation and this gives us greater than or equal to x1 to the 1012. And this is our desired inequality. So that is all there is to question one. And I know CMO is uh, typically a difficult Olympiad, but I would say that this problem one is one of the easier problem ones I've seen in CMO in a number of years. So I hope you enjoyed this problem. And do check out the previous videos on CMO Problem 1 if you are interested. Subscribe to the channel for more math videos and see you soon.